here and welcome back for another lesson in AP US history. Today I am tackling a push topic 4.8 Jackson and federal power. So our learning objective for this lesson is to explain the causes and effects of continuing policy debates about the role of the federal government from 1800 to 1848. But we are really focusing in on the administration of Andrew Jackson in this lesson. So we're looking at the rise of new political parties. We're going to talk about Democrats and Whigs and the things that they disagreed about. But we need to set the stage a little bit about why the Whig Party developed. And that has us take a look at what Jackson did in regards to federal power. We're also going to look at Jackson's treatment of American Indians and how they sought to resist encroachments on their lands. So we're looking at Jackson as president, particularly looking at his role in expanding presidential power, the nullification crisis, the bank war. And then we're going to discuss frontier expansion and American Indian resistance. And finally, we will end by looking at what is called the second party system. So we're setting the stage here by looking at the historical context. And what we need to do is we need to look at the election of 1828. In the election of 1828, we see a huge rise in participatory democracy. Jackson had believed that the election was stolen from him in 1824. And so essentially, once that election is settled and John Quincy Adams becomes president, Jackson begins his campaign in the 1828 election as a person of the common man, that he will represent the common man. And so we see a lot of areas increasing the ability for white men to participate in democracy by removing property restrictions and other things that allowed for increased um, participation in the whole political process. Um, we also see population growing significantly in our Western territories. And so a lot of our peoples living in the frontier don't feel a connection to the urban areas, especially in the Northeast, and their political power is going to grow as their territories become states. So Jackson as president, as we already mentioned, he portrayed himself as the protector of the common man. He's our first president from the frontier, from an area past the Appalachian Mountains. And so he believes that he is going to represent those people. However, during his presidency, he ends up gaining the nickname of King Andrew because he increases presidential power so much that he ends up acting like a monarch um, in some people's eyes. And so he is opposed to things like federal spending and increasing the national debt. He wants to strictly interpret the Constitution. And so we're thinking back to our original Democratic Republicans as opposed to the Federalists. He wants to hold tightly to the um, Constitution being strictly interpreted. And he does use the veto more than any other president, including all of their vetoes combined. He often used his vetoes to um, restrict or prevent federal funds being used to construct internal improvements, especially state roads. And then his biggest veto that he's most known for is rechartering the Second Bank of the United States, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. So we're going to first start with the nullification crisis. This is a huge moment in Jackson's presidency. Jackson is going to favor states' rights as a Democrat, but not to the point of disunion. And so he is going to utilize federal force to make sure that states are following what the federal laws state. So in 1828, a, another tariff is passed. It's called the Tariff of Abominations, and it raises duties or taxes up to 45%. And this has a significant negative impact in the South, and it benefits Northern factories. And so the, the South Carolina government is going to declare the tariff unconstitutional. And this is an idea that is advanced by the vice president, John C. Calhoun. And so they use the theory of nullification to say that a state has the right to declare a federal law null or void. And in 1832, Cal uh, South Carolina is going to nullify both the 1828 and then the 1832 tariffs. 
What happens after that is a series of debates over the power of the states versus the power of the federal government. And the webster hayne debate is really famous for this difference between states' rights and federal government. So a Massachusetts Senator, Daniel Webster, is going to argue that states don't have the right to defy or secede from the union, whereas South Carolina Senator Robert Hayne says, says that states do have this right because they were sovereign and independent when they created created the union, therefore they maintain that sovereignty during um, now in 1830. Andrew Jackson responds to this debate and he says, our federal union, it must be preserved. Vice President John C. Calhoun, who was in favor of nullification, said the union next to our liberties most dear. And so we see this controversy developing in the federal government so much so that John C. Calhoun ends up resigning his role. So what happens um, as this nullification crisis grows? Well, after South Carolina declares that the tariffs are null, Calhoun, or, um, Jackson tells the Secretary of War to prepare for military action against them against South Carolina. And he persuades Congress to pass a bill that would allow Jackson to act against South Carolina with the military. And then he issues a proclamation to the people saying that nullification and disunion are treasonous. But at the same time, he also argues that Congress should lower the tariff. And so Henry Clay, our great compromiser, we see his name pop up again and again related to compromises. He proposes that a bill called the Compromise of 1833 that would slowly reduce tariffs over the next decade. South Carolina responds and postpones nullification and then completely rescinds their nullification as the passage of the lower tariff comes into effect. And so the, the nullification crisis does avoid actual military confrontation, but it's a pretty big moment where Jackson is willing to use the federal government or the federal military against a state. All right, another significant moment in Jackson's presidency is the bank war. And so what we need to know about the bank is that this was something that was privately owned but received federal deposits. And the main goal of the bank is to maintain a um, stable national economy, deal with currency, deal with inflation, try to keep a stable national economy. And there are three major people involved in the bank war. First off is the bank president, Nicholas Biddle. So he's a private citizen, very arrogant, and many people believed that his management of the bank was corrupt and favored the elite. President Andrew Jackson is another major person involved, and he is going to verbally attack Biddle and says the Bank of the United States is abusing its power. And he also believes that the bank is unconstitutional, even though that had already been decided in McCulloch versus Maryland that the bank was constitutional. And then our third major player is once again, Henry Clay, who is in favor of the bank and uh, persuaded Congress to pass a bill that would recharter the bank. All right, so Congress passes this bill to recharter the bank. It gets to Jackson and he vetoes the bill. And so the Bank of the United States, their charter expires in 1836. And at that point, Jackson withdraws all the federal funds from the Bank of the United States and transfers them to state banks, similar to his ideas as a Democrat to give more power to state banks banks and local control. The impact is that without the Bank of the United States, the United States economy flounders and um, a financial crisis known as the Panic of 1837 ensues and the bank actually goes bankrupt in 1841. So as a result of the bank war, we see a financial crisis ensuing in our late 1830s. So this is a political cartoon that you may see um, related to the bank war, and it's actually a pro-Jackson satire. So here Jackson is portrayed as the cat, and he has his tail is marked veto, and he is protecting Uncle Sam's barn from rats. And rats at this time really symbolized corruption. And so you see a few different phrases here, but the rats are talking about how they're trying to hide or how they're going to um, 
uh, how there's no chance for them to get after the corn crib, um, which is a symbol for the capital, the money, the infrastructure. And then you see men outside of the barn that are um, cheering on the cat as it goes after these corrupt individuals, namely um, Nicholas Biddle, the bank president, and Henry Clay. Okay, moving on to our um, third topic here, which is going to be frontier expansion and American Indian resistance. A few things that you should know in context for this is that Jackson is, had become a war hero in part for his role in fighting in the Seminole Wars. And so he is a very aggressive. Um, he led to the loss of land and loss of life for many American Indians, specifically the Seminoles. And as a person who grew up in the frontier, he has sympathy for Westerners who are seeking to expand their land. And his personal belief is that American Indians should, remove, should be removed to west of the Mississippi River. Now, at this time, many American Indian tribes, specifically the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole, had made efforts to assimilate to white culture. And so in this image, you see Chief John Ross. He's the chief of the Cherokee tribe. And you can see that he is dressed like a white person would. He looks, he has short hair, and he does not have the typical American Indian or the traditional American Indian dress. And that's just one way that American Indians attempted to assimilate. They also had a written language, formal laws and constitution. All of this were in an effort to maintain their lands with and sovereignty within the United States. Okay, so there's our context. And also on the maps, you can see that in these times from 18, 1784 to 1839, there is a severe loss of land of American Indian tribes to the United States. All right, in 1830, Congress passes the Indian Removal Act, and this is going to have a couple components to it, um, but most importantly, it forces the resettlement of American Indians. So there's the language of the act. It says an act to provide for an exchange of lands of, with Indians residing in any of the states or territories and for their removal west of the river Mississippi. And so you see some language in here, um, west of the river Mississippi, Indian title has been extinguished, tribes of Indians may choose to exchange lands and remove there lawful for the president to exchange. So you're seeing a lot of this language about exchanging lands and removing American Indians west of the Mississippi. And by 1835, most tribes had complied. They had moved because they felt that this was their only option. In 1836, the creation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs is created. That's going to become really important in our future units. And um, it, based on the Indian Removal Act, most American Indians did move. However, one tribe specifically resisted, and that is going to be the Cherokee. They used the American court system to sue for their right to their land. And so the Cherokee sue for their land in Worcester v. Georgia in 1832. And it, the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rules that Georgia laws cannot be enforced on Cherokee lands due to pr prior treaties, due to the fact that the negotiations between tribes had to be with the U.S. government, not with Georgia. And so essentially the Cherokee were guaranteed the right to their lands in Georgia. However, Jackson is going to refuse to enforce the court's decision. He says, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Basically taunting uh, Chief Justice John Marshall saying, you can do what you want, but I'm the one who enforces it and I don't agree. Therefore, I'm not going to. This would be an impeachable offense, but no president had been impeached up till this point. And frankly, much of Congress wanted American Indians to be removed. And so there was an interest in enforcing the Supreme Court decision. This, of course, leads to the Trail of Tears, where the U.S. Army forced around 16,000 Cherokee to resettle in Cherokee territory or in Indian territory, which is marked with the purple on this map map. And this trail of tears led to the deaths of 4,000 Cherokee. 
So here's a quote by John G. Burnett, who was a soldier in the U.S. Army, who actually um, spoke Cherokee as well. And so he was hired as a translator. So he says, here's some excerpts. I witnessed the execution of the most brutal order in the history of American warfare. I saw the helpless Cherokees arrested and dragged from their homes and driven at the bayonet point into the stockades. On the morning of November 17th, we encountered a terrific sleet and snowstorm with freezing temperatures. And from that day until we reached the end of the fateful journey on March the 26th, 1839, the sufferings of the Cherokee were awful. The trail was a trail of death. They had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without fire. And I have known as many as 22 of them to die in one night of pneumonia due to ill treatment, cold, and exposure. The long, painful journey to the West was ended March 26, 1839, with 4,000 silent graves. And covetousness, greed, on the part of the white race was the cause of all that the Cherokees had to suffer. In the year 1828, a little Indian boy living on Ward Creek had sold a gold nugget to a white trader, and that nugget sealed the doom of the Cherokees. In a short time, the country was overrun with armed brigades claiming to be government agents who paid no attention to the rights of Indians who were the legal possessors of the country. So, this excerpt is significantly longer. I encourage you to go read the whole thing. But what I like about this part is that it, it tells the horrors that they experienced, but it also provides the context for the forced removal. And it was gold. It was economic opportunity that forced the Cherokee to be removed. Okay, our last major topic is to talk about the second party system. And when you see this term second party system, it's a phrase used to describe the political system from 1828 to 1854. So we're moving from this era of good feelings, this time when there's one major political party to two political parties. And this is one of the very unique times in American history where each party had relatively equal footing in each region. So there was competition equally for the parties in each um, region. So the Whigs are going to be led primarily by Henry Clay, and a lot of their voters will end up coming from urban areas, and they will primarily be English Protestants, um, but they will be more of the professional workers in urban settings, whereas Democrats led by Andrew Jackson have urban workers that are voting for them, as well as many of the um, farmers, frontiersmen in the South and the West. The Whigs are going to be most similar to the Federalists from earlier in um, this curriculum. They are more in favor of a strong federal government and support the ideas of the American system. Democrats, as I mentioned throughout this unit, are more in favor of local rule and states' rights, a limited government, a strict interpretation of the Constitution. The Whigs are really concerned with crime associated with immigrants, liberal capitalism, and they are against American Indian removal, whereas Democrats are concerned about the gap between the rich and the poor. They're concerned about monopolies and um, the really the causes that are significant to our laborers and our frontiers people. So keep these ideas in mind as we continue through this unit. I hope that this was helpful for understanding the causes and effects of continuing policy debates and the role of the federal government. Um, thank you for watching and please like and subscribe.